So in Alabama, it's illegal to wear a fake mustache in church that causes laughter. And in Louisiana, mourners at a wake are forbidden to eat more than three sandwiches. And in New York, it's illegal to throw a ball at someone's head for fun. And so I've spent a decent amount of time uh, studying archaic, seemingly outdated laws over the years. And like the rabbis of the Talmud, I have a few questions. <laughs> if I wear a fake mustache that is absolutely not funny, but someone chooses to laugh either in my proximity to something completely unrelated or out of a personal vendetta to have me punished, Am I liable or is this laughter that's, you know, because it's not inherently caused by the mustache, am I off the hook? Uh, I'll move on to the legal catch 22 we find ourselves in in Louisiana. If I'm at this wake and they're serving hot dogs um, or wraps or even bagels, um, are these considered sandwiches? Um, and furthermore, what if I'm at the wake to offer support to a loved one, but I, in fact, didn't know the deceased. If I'm not a mourner, am I then entitled to four or more sandwiches? <laughs> uh, and of course, I know the question that's on all of our minds, but if I throw a ball at someone's head in New York, but I have zero fun at all, <laughs> am I innocent? And let's not all just sit here and pretend like we think the New York Mets and the New York Yankees find their jobs in entirely boring. Something's not right here. So these antiquated pieces of state legislation known as blue laws are, are largely unenforced and in many cases were written with some self-awareness of their absurdity. Um, they're often written in ways that even if they were serious matters, uh, they'd be entirely impossible to enforce due to either their vagueness or some sort of incongruence with other laws or social norms. I share them with you as we arrive this week at Parashat Be'ha'alotcha, um, a time when the Israelites have now been wandering uh, through the desert officially for one year. It's the first anniversary of their liberation from Egypt, which means that for the very first time, they're celebrating the holiday of Passover. So what we think of, this holiday of prayer, uh, ritual around a table, at a, at a, traditionally at a Seder uh, or at services, uh, for, then, uh, for them it was commemorated through uh, gathering and then offering sacrifices, uh, specifically what was known as the Pesach offering, an acknowledgement of the Pesach, the passing over, that the divine did for the Israelites and their firstborns during the, the final plague. But at this point in our narrative in Torah, the Israelites have also received many mitzvot and are now living an observant lifestyle um, as part of their covenantal relationship with God. They're living out a life of observing these commandments of these mitzvot. And among these commandments is one where Israelites are instructed to not even come near the tabernacle, the place where offerings are brought, um, if they've been in recent contact with a dead body uh, until they've completed this purification process, which can take a number of days. So shortly after God is commanding the Israelites to come offer this Pesach offering for the first time, we encounter a group of Israelites who've actually just performed one of the holiest mitzvot to this day, the burial rituals of a dear loved one. So they approach Moses, somewhere between confused, flustered, and severely panicked. You mean to tell us that even though we're impure because we performed another mitzvah, a mitzvah of, per of bearing a loved one, we're now going to be forced into sinning by not partaking in this yearly offering. So one read is that these folks are just disappointed uh, to miss an opportunity to be with community, to celebrate, to be in deeper connection or intimacy with the divine. Uh, 
another reading, and perhaps more likely, is that these Israelites know that the punishment for skipping out on this ritual is very serious. It's exile from the community. So Moses, greatest prophet of our tradition, natural problem solver, calmly, thoughtfully responds. Uh, and I'm going to quote the text of the Torah literally here. Stand by. In other words, hold, please. Or put differently, yeah, I'm stumped. What we've arrived at here in our Parsha is one of four places in the Torah where the, Moses and the Israelites are confronted uh, with a situation in which the law is either unclear or the people are left dissatisfied with the law. So when Moses says, stand by, what he's actually doing is openly acknowledging that something isn't right here. No need to worry. Let me go clear this up with God. And my teacher, Dr. Ben Summer, um, when talking about this moment, explains it in a way that I find actually very theologically comforting. He, he writes that the Torah acknowledges without embarrassment or discomfort that what God has wrought is not always set in stone. The law not only can be upgraded, but the upgrade can then be upgraded. The narrative in just a moment will go on to make clear that God does not find this insulting. In fact, the divine seems perfectly satisfied with the situation in which the Israelites are participating alongside in allowing the law, the custom, the mitzvot to develop over time. So after conferring with God about this incongruence among the mitzvot, Moses returns with the following report. Speak to the Israelite people saying, when any party, whether you or your future generations, who is defiled by a corpse or on a long journey would offer a Passover sacrifice to Adonai, they shall have the ability to offer it one month later. So at first glance, what our tradition is offering here is powerful, but fairly straightforward and practical. Not only can we make space for change and evolution, but it's important, it's even vital, that we make accommodations for those who need them, create spaces for second chances. This Pesach Sheni, this second Pesach offering, is what we call this moment. However, upon closer inspection, I actually believe that this ruling from God only scratches the surface of this profound and I believe evolutionary moment in our tradition. And so before I read God's words back to you, I'll remind us that the only issue that was brought forth by these Israelites was how do we accommodate those who are ritually impure after performing the mitzvot around losing a loved one. That's, that was the only concern. And yet, this is God's response. Anyone, whether you or future generations, who is defiled by a corpse or is on a long journey, may offer the Pesach offering one month later. Okay, so similarly to the blue laws, I have some questions. The people make no mention of a long journey. So why is God making a point to include this among the possible exemptions? And if this is important enough to add in as a surprise addendum to the laws of the Pesach Sheni, the Pesach offering, how do we define a long journey? How far is it? What modes of transportation are available? Does the, does the definition of this distance change across generations? The Mishnah provides us with a considerably striking response. The Mishnah, our oral tradition, passed down generation after generation until our rabbis decided to write it down. It got too hard to play a game of telephone forever. We read, what is a distant journey, even from the very threshold of the temple courtyard and beyond? I'll say that again, even from the very threshold of the courtyard. What can this possibly mean? Is the Mishnah actually saying that if someone is literally standing at the entrance of the temple, mere steps away from the place that the Israelites would go to gather each year on Passover, that they can be excused from this holiest of rituals? 
This is enough distance to make a legitimate claim that the journey was far enough or too strenuous or, or too much for them to take on. Well, I find comfort in knowing that our sage has struggled with this very question. And Chizkuni is a French 13th century rabbi and biblical commentator, provides a little insight. He explains, we're to understand the person concerned as being spiritually on a journey that had estranged them to Judaism and God. Furthermore, the reason that the verse includes the cause you, clause you or your future generations is to explain that this person might also be spiritually distant or far in terms of time. Perhaps it's been many years since they've been in Jewish community, since they've performed this ritual, and they feel disconnected and they no longer have their heart in it. I just want to lift this up as a moment where there's this remarkable display of not just innovation and change, but this collaboration that starts between the Israelites and Moses and then involves God, but then involves several generations of rabbis and commentators. This ritual of Pesach Sheni essentially becomes this explicit act of calling out to those in our communities who are either feeling physically, but really more likely spiritually distant in order to provide some sort of comfort or reassurance that, that if you're not ready, if you need more time, if you're just feeling distant, that's totally okay. Take your time, and when things change, there will be another chance to bring your Pesach offering, another chance to gather in community, another opportunity that you can reconnect with the genuine and authentic kavana and intention that you need to show up in that moment. And I'm moved by this teaching, not only for the space it offers each of us who know this feeling, right? This feeling of being disconnected or of feeling inadequate or of being unsure if we're good enough to show up. But I also love the stark reminder it provides those of us that already find ourselves within the walls of the tabernacle or are already sitting at the Seder table, or already found ourselves here tonight. My teacher, Rabbi Gordon Tucker, he shared his personal experience of struggling for years of what to make of those that were standing right outside the temple. He asked, why wouldn't they just take the step inside, the one step inside? And so some of his rabbinic colleagues in Israel shared with him this phenomenon that they would witness year after year where scores of Israelis, specifically those who openly and proudly identified as secular Jews, would find themselves gathering outside of the synagogue. They wouldn't enter, but they also would take the step of leaving their home. There was something that compelled them, but unsure if they would fit in, if they'd be welcomed, if they'd be understood or even respected, they could only manage to get to the gateway. What Rabbi Tucker is coming to understand and sharing and teaching the story is that for those who don't have the courage to enter the walls of the ancient temple courtyard or who couldn't make it to services on Yom Kippur or wondered if they could make it to shul tonight but couldn't muster the ability to show up, this Pesach Sheni. It teaches us that we're forbidden, forbidden to forget them and we're forbidden to give up on these folks. Because it's not only they that have the second chance, it's all of us that also have this second chance, the second chance to meet them where they're at, to recognize and uplift the divine spark we find in all, in all of us, all of us created in the image of God and to let them know that what beyond this threshold is, isn't judgment, but it's a compassionate nurturance and a spiritual nourishment. So again, maybe you're still wondering, am I supposed to be here tonight? Or asking yourself, what good am I? Or even thinking, am I allowed to eat more than three sandwiches at Oneg? And I'll say again, directly and unequivocally, absolutely, and of course, and we're so grateful that you're here. And if at some point in the near future, your journey takes you back out to the threshold, 
Take as much time and as many second chances as you need, but know that when you're ready, we can't wait to have you back with all of your complexity, your effervescence, your holiness, back into the embrace of our Kahila Kadosha, our holy community. Shabbat Shalom. one beautiful Jewish rabbi's words to another we'd like to share with you a song written by the holy Rav Rabbi Dylan what good am I if I'm like all the rest If I just turn away When I see how you're dressed If I shut myself off So I can hear you cry What good am I What good am I If I know and don't do If I see and don't see And I laugh in the face of what 
Why? 